In this video, we're going to go over a basic introduction uh, slash overview of college algebra. So let's begin with some basics. What is x squared times x to the fifth power? What do you do to the exponents when you multiply common bases? x squared times x to the fifth power is x to the seventh power. When you multiply by a similar base, you are allowed to add the exponents. x squared can be thought of as x times x. You're multiplying two x variables together. x to the fifth power is basically five x variables together. Combined, you have a total of seven x variables, which represents that. What about division? What is x to the fifth power divided by x squared? When you divide, you need to subtract the top number by the bottom number. 5 minus 2 is 3. Again, if you expand it, it can make sense. x to the fifth power is 5x's multiplied to each other. x squared is just 2x's. So you can cancel two of them, which leaves 3 on top. So let's try another example. What is uh, x to the fourth divided by x to the seventh? So taking the top number, subtracting the bottom number, 4 minus 7 is negative 3. And whenever you have a negative exponent, you can move the x variable from the top to the bottom. And as you do that, the sign will change. The negative 3 will change into a positive 3. So this is the same as 1 over x cubed. Now let's expand it. x to the fourth is basically four x variables multiplied to each other. x to the seventh represents seven x variables. We can cancel four on top, four on the bottom, and so we're left with three on the bottom, which is x cubed. Now, what is x cubed raised to the fourth power? Whenever you raise one exponent to another exponent, you are allowed to multiply them. Three times four is 12. So the answer is x to the 12th power. One way you could think about it, imagine x cubed raised to the 4th power is equivalent to 4 x cubes multiplied to each other. That's what it really represents. And each x cubed represents the multiplication of 3 x variables. So when you combine them, you have a total of 12 x variables multiply to each other. So that's why you get x to the 12. Anytime you raise something to the 0 power, it's always equal to 1. That's something you just have to commit to memory. Now let's talk about simplifying expressions and combining like terms. If you were to see something like this on a test, 5x plus 3 plus 7x minus 4, how would you simplify this expression? Notice the 5x and the 7x are like terms. They both carry the variable x. 5 plus 7 is 12, so 5x plus 7x is 12x. Now, these two don't have an x variable attached to it, so they're similar to each other. 3 plus negative 4 is the same as 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. Go ahead and try this one. 3x squared plus 6x plus 8 plus 9x squared plus 7x minus 5. Feel free to take a minute, pause the video, and work on this example. So these two are like terms. 3 plus 9 is 12. And we can add these two. 6 plus 7 is 13. And then we can add these two. 8 plus negative 5 or 8 minus 5 is positive 3. Here's another one that we could try. 5x squared minus 3x plus 7 minus 4x squared minus 8x minus 11. Now the first thing we should do is we should distribute this negative sign to each of these three terms before we combine like terms. 
if you want to avoid making mistakes. Now we don't have a negative sign in front of the first set of terms inside the first parentheses, so we could just open it. So what we have now is 5x squared minus 3x plus 7. And if we distribute the negative signs to everything on the right, all the signs will change. The positive 4x squared will now become negative 4x squared. The negative 8x will now change to positive 8x. And the same is true for the 11. It's going to change from negative 11 to positive 11. So now let's combine like terms. 5x squared minus 4x squared is 1x squared. Negative 3 plus 8, which is the same as 8 minus 3, is positive 5. And 7 plus 11 is 18. So you're going to get this. Now, what if we want to multiply two expressions instead of adding and subtracting polynomials? By the way, this is a monomial. That's one term. Two terms represent a binomial. Three terms represent a trinomial. And if you have like many terms, you can simply call it a polynomial. It's good to be familiar with those expressions. So here we're multiplying two binomials. We need to use something called FOIL. In FOIL, the first letter F is for the first part. We multiply the first two terms. 3x times 2x is 6x squared. And then you multiply the term on the outside. 3x times negative 6, which is negative 18x. And then the ones on the inside, negative 5 times 2x, that's negative 10x. And then the last ones, negative 5 times negative 6, which is positive 30. So now let's combine the two terms in the middle, since they're like terms. Negative 18x plus negative 10x is negative 28x. So this is the answer. Now, how can we expand an expression that looks like this? What would you do if you saw that on this S? To expand it, the square means that we have two 2x two minus 5 factors multiplied to each other. So we can use the FOIL technique again. 2x times 2x, 2 times 2 is 4, x times x is x squared, 2x times negative 5 is negative 10x, and negative 5 times 2x is also negative 10x. Negative 5 times negative 5 is positive 25. Now we can add like terms. Negative 10 plus negative 10 is negative 20. And so this is the answer. Now what about solving linear equations? How can we solve for x? What number? plus 6 is 11. It turns out that 5 plus 6 is 11. So x is equivalent to 5. But to find the answer, notice that we see x plus 6. The opposite of addition is subtraction. So we need to subtract both sides by 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. So these two cancel. You can bring down the x. And 11 minus 6 is 5. So that's how you can solve it. Now what if x is multiplied to a number? What can we do to solve for x? The opposite of multiplication is division. So you want to divide both sides by 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. So you get 1x, which is simply equal to x. 8 divided by 4 is 2. And so that's how you can solve for x. So now, what if we have a combination of multiplication and addition in the equation? What can we do? So first, we should subtract both sides by 5. Don't divide by 3, not yet. Otherwise, you'll have a fraction. These two will cancel. We could bring down the 3x. 26 minus 5 is 21. Next, let's divide both sides by 3. 
21 divided by 3 is 7. And so this is the answer. Try this one. So what do you think we should do here in this problem? There's many ways you can go about solving it. You can distribute the 4 to the 2x to the negative 7, or you could subtract both sides by 8. I'm going to subtract both sides by 8. So on the left, we have 4 times 2x minus 7. And on the right, we have 20 minus 8, which is 12. Now at this point, you can distribute the 4, or you can divide both sides by 4. If you do that, you'll be left with 2x minus 7 is equal to 12 divided by 4, which is 3. And now we can add 7 to both sides. So what we're going to have is uh, 2x, which is equal to 3 plus 7. That's 10. And if we divide both sides by 2, 10 divided by 2 is 5. So x is 5. And you could check your work to make sure you have the right answer. If we replace x with 5, the left side should equal 20. So let's go ahead and do that. 2 times 5 is 10. 10 minus 7 is 3. 4 times 3 is 12. And 12 plus 8 is 20. So it works. Now let's move on to solving and graphing inequalities. So let's say if we have the expression 2x plus 5 is greater than 11. Now when you solve it, imagine as if this is an equal sign. All the rules still apply. So let's solve for x. Let's begin by subtracting both sides by 5. So 2x is greater than 11 minus 5, which is 6. Next, let's divide both sides by 2. So x is greater than 3. Now, how can we plot this on a number line? So let's put 0 in the center. And somewhere to the right, we have a 3. For the expression x is greater than 3, we need to shade to the right of 3. If it was less than 3, we need to shade towards the left. Now, it's greater than 3, but not greater than or equal to 3. If it was greater than or equal to 3, we would have to draw a closed circle. But since it's only greater than 3, we need to use an open circle, and we're going to shade towards the right. So that's how you can uh, graph this particular inequality. By the way, if you have to write the answer in interval notation, make sure you understand that negative infinity is all the way to the left and positive infinity is to the right. So we're starting at 3 and we're stopping at infinity. So you can write the answer from 3 to infinity in interval notation. Let's try another example. Go ahead and solve for x. Find its value. So let's begin by subtracting both sides by 7. So 13 minus 7 is 6. Next, let's divide both sides by 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So 2 is to the right of 0. Now because it's equal to or greater than 2, we need to use a closed circle. And we're going to shade it to the right. So the answer in interval notation is from 2 to infinity, but it includes 2. So we need to use a bracket instead of uh, a parenthesis. Whenever you have a closed circle, use a bracket. For open circles, use parentheses, and infinity, you should always use parentheses. Let's try another example. Let's say that negative 3x is greater than or equal to 9. Solve for x. So let's begin by dividing both sides by negative 3. Negative 9, I mean positive 9, 
divided by negative 3 is negative 3. When you multiply or divide by a negative number, the inequality changes sign. So you have to flip it. So that's the solution. x is less than or equal to negative 3. So negative 3 is on the left side of 0. And because we have the underline here, we need to use a closed circle as opposed to an open circle. And because it's less than, we need to shade towards left. So in interval notation, the answer is from negative infinity to negative 3. But it includes negative 3 since we have a closed circle. So whenever you write the answer in interval notation, always start from the left and then write the answer on the right. So always go from left to right. Try this one. Negative 5x plus 8 is greater than negative 7. So let's begin by subtracting both sides by negative 8. So negative 5x is greater than negative 7 minus 8, which is negative 15. Now let's divide both sides by negative 5. So the inequality will change sign or direction. So x is now less than positive 3. So let's use an open circle, and we're going to shade to the left. So viewing it from left to right, the value all the way to the left is negative infinity, and the value all the way to the right is 3. So the answer in the interval notation is negative infinity to 3, but it does not include 3 since we have an open circle. So always write it from left to right. Now let's spend some time talking about absolute value expressions. What is the absolute value of negative 3 and 3? The absolute value of positive 3 is positive 3. The absolute value of negative 3 is still positive 3. The absolute value will make any number and change it into a positive number. However, the absolute value of 0 will just be 0. But it will never give you a negative output. So knowing that, if the absolute value of x is equal to 4, what is the value of x? x can be two answers. It can be positive 4 or negative 4. The absolute value of positive 4 is 4, and the absolute value of negative 4 is positive 4. So whenever you're dealing with absolute value equations, you need to write two equations in order to solve for x. The next example will demonstrate that. So let's say if the absolute value of 2x plus 3 is 11. To solve it, write the original equation without the absolute value expression. And for the second one, make it equal to negative 11. So here, let's subtract both sides by 3. 11 minus 3 is 8. And then let's divide by 2. So the first answer is positive 4. Now let's get the second answer. Negative 11 minus 3 is negative 14. And if we divide this by 2, negative 14 divided by 2 is negative 7. So here's the second answer. So x can equal 4 or negative 7. Try this one. Let's say that the absolute value of 3x minus 1 is greater than 5. So what can we do if we have an inequality and an absolute value expression? So we're going to write two equations. The original one is going to remain the same. Now the second one, you need to do two things. You need to change the direction of the absolute value expression and change the 5 into negative 5. And then solve for both equations. So let's add one. 3x is greater than 6, and then let's divide by 3. So x is greater than 2. 6 divided by 3 is 2. Here, let's do the same thing. Let's add 1 to both sides. Negative 5 plus 1 is negative 4. And now let's divide by 3. So x is less than negative 4 thirds. And negative 4 thirds is negative 1.33 as a decimal. So now what we're going to do is plot the solution. So here's 2, and negative 1.33 is somewhere between negative 1 and 2. 
So x is greater than 2. So we have an open circle shaded to the right. And it's less than uh, negative 1.33. This is really an or statement whenever you see it splits off into two directions like that. So how can we write the answer in interval notation? So we have two sections. For the blue section, the answer is negative infinity to negative 4 thirds. For the red section, it's 2 to infinity. And you can connect these two with a union symbol. So this is the solution in interval notation. Now what if you were to see a compound inequality that looks like this? What can we do in order to solve for x? So there's like three sides to the equation. We're going to subtract all three sides by 4. Negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. These two will cancel, and 13 minus 4 is 9. Next, let's divide all three sides by 3. So you can just do it simultaneously. Negative 6 divided by 3 is negative 2. And since we divide it by a positive number, the direction of the inequalities will not change. 9 divided by 3 is 3. And so we get this. So now we can plot it on a number line. So what this really means is that x is between negative 2 and 3. So this expression tells you that negative 2 is greater than or equal to x, or if you read it backwards, x is less than or equal to negative 2. So, and then the other one is x is greater than or equal to 3. And it turns out this is another or statement. It's actually not between negative 2 or 3. So this is like the other one. So the answer is from negative infinity to negative 2, union 3 to infinity. But it includes 2 and 3, so we need to use brackets. Let's try another example. Let's say 2x plus 5 is less than or equal to, let's say, uh, 13, but it's greater than or equal to uh, 1. So this one should be like a, an and inequality as opposed to an or inequality. So let's subtract both sides by 5. So 1 minus 5 is negative 4. 13 minus 5 is 8. Next, let's divide both sides by 2. So x is greater than or equal to negative 2, but less than or equal to 4. So therefore, x is between negative 2 and positive 4. So it's here. The answer in interval notation is from negative 2 to 4. Now let's talk about how to graph linear equations in slope-intercept form. Slope-intercept form looks like this y is equal to mx plus b. m represents the slope, b is the y-intercept. So let's say if we want to graph this equation, y is equal to 2x minus 3. So let's make a graph first. So first, plot the y-intercept. So that's the point 0, negative 3, or simply negative 3 on the y-axis. The slope is 2, which is the same as 2 over 1. The top number represents the rise. The bottom number represents the run. So what we're going to do is we're going to rise 2 units and only run 1 unit, which will take us to the point 1, negative 1. So the next point is over here. And then to find the second point, go up 2 units over 1, which will take us to 2, comma 1, and then go up 2 over 1. That will take us to 3, comma 3. And then just connect these points with a line. So that's how you can graph a linear equation in slope and intercept form. Now what if we have a fraction? Let's say if we have the expression 
y is equal to negative 3 over 4x plus 5. How can we graph this particular equation? So we can see the slope is negative 3 over 4. So the rise is negative 3, the run is 4. The y-intercept is 5. So let's plot the y-intercept at 5. To find the next point, the rise is negative 3, which means we need to go down 3. And we need to travel 4 units to the right. As long as you have two points, it's enough to graph the equation acceptably. So it looks like this. Now let's talk about how to graph linear equations if it's presented in standard form which is ax plus by equals c. Now the best way to graph this equation is to use the intercept method. So let's work on an example. Let's say that 2x plus 3y is equal to 6. So let's begin by finding the x-intercept. To find the x-intercept, replace y with 0. So 2x plus 3 times 0 is equal to 6. 3 times 0 is just 0, so 2x is equal to 6 and x is 3. So the x-intercept is 3 comma 0. Now let's find a y-intercept. To do that, replace x with 0 and solve for y. Now 2 times 0 is 0, so we just have 3y is equal to 6. And if we divide by 2, I mean by 3, 6 divided by 3 is 2. So the y-intercept is 0 comma 2. So what we're going to do is simply plot the x and y-intercepts and then connect them with a line. So the x-intercept is 3, 0. So that's x equals 3 on the x-axis, which is right here. And on the y-axis, we need to plot 2, or 0, 2. And then just connect these two points with a line. So that's how you can graph an equation in standard form. Now it's your turn. Try this example. Let's say that 3x minus 4y is equal to uh, 12. Find the x and y-intercepts and go ahead and plot it. So let's start with the x-intercept. So let's replace y with 0. So we can see that 3x is equal to 12. And if we divide both sides by 3, x is equal to 4. So the x-intercept is 4 comma 0. Now let's find the y-intercept. And let's do that by replacing x with 0. So 3 times 0 is 0. So we just have negative 4y is equal to 12. And now let's divide by negative 4. So 12 divided by negative 4 is negative 3. So the y-intercept is 0, negative 3. So the x-intercept is 4 units to the right. The y-intercept is 3 units down. So 0, negative 3 is over here. And then simply connect the two points with a line. That's how you do it. Now let's talk about how to graph functions with transformations. Let's start with the absolute value of x function. So to graph this function, the origin is at 0, 0. The general shape, it looks like a v-shape. But you want to get the points right. The number in front of x is a 1. So it has a slope of 1 on the right side and a slope of negative 1 on the left. So as you go 1 to the right, you need to go up 1. So you're going to have the point 1, 1. And then 1 to the right, up 1. So you're at the point 2, 2, and 3, 3, and so forth. The left side is a reflection of the right side relative to the vertex. The vertex is at the origin, 0, 0. So the graph looks like this. Now what about if we put a 2 in front of it. So now the slope has a value of 2. So the origin is still the same, but this time as we travel one unit to the right, we need to go up 2. So the next point is going to be 1, 2. And then to the left, it's going to be the same. And if we travel one more unit to the right, we need to go up 2. So it's going to be 2, 4 and negative 2, 4. 
So it looks like this. If you need to draw an accurate graph, that's what you can do. But from here on, we're going to draw just a rough sketch. So we know that the absolute value of x is just a v-shape that opens this way with a slope of 1. But what if there's a negative sign in front of the absolute value of x? What's going to happen? If there's a negative sign, it's going to reflect over the x-axis. So instead of opening in the upward direction, it's going to open downward. Now, what if we have this expression, absolute value x plus 2 on the inside? What's going to happen? To find out, set the inside equal to 0. If you solve for x, you'll see that x is negative 2. So the graph is going to start at negative 2, which means that it shifts 2 units to the left, and it's going to open upward. So let's say if we have absolute value x minus 3, this is going to shift 3 units to the right. If you set the inside equal to 0, x will equal 3. So the new origin is at 3 comma 0. And then it's going to open upward with a slope of 1. Now what if the number is outside of the absolute value? What happens in this case? The 2 will cause it to shift 2 units up but it's still going to open in the upward direction. So let's say if we have a negative absolute value of x minus 1. So the graph is going to shift one unit down, but because of the negative sign in front of the absolute value, it's not going to open upward. It's going to open downward. So it looks like that. So let's put it together. What if we have the absolute value of x minus 3 plus 2? So this is going to shift 2 units to the right, I mean 3 units to the right, but up 2 units, and it's going to open uh, upward. Now let's change the parent function into a quadratic function, or a parabola. The parent function for y equals x squared is a u-shape instead of a v-shape and it opens downward. So based on your knowledge of transformations, what's the shape of the graph negative x squared? So putting a negative in front will cause it to reflect over the x-axis. So it's going to open downward. Now try these two examples. Let's say if we have x minus 2 squared and x plus 4 squared. So you know for the first one, it's going to shift two units to the right, and it's going to open upward. For the second one, it's going to shift four units to the left, and it's going to open upward. So try this one. x squared minus 1, and negative x squared plus 3. So this one is going to shift one unit down, and it's going to open upward. The next one is going to shift three units up, but because of the negative in front of the x squared, it's going to open downward. So now let's try this one. x minus 1 squared plus 2, and 3 minus x plus 2 squared. So for the first one, it's going to shift 1 to the right, up 2. So it starts here, and because there's a positive in front, it's going to open upward. The next example is going to shift 2 to the left, up 3. So it starts at negative 2, comma 3, and because the negative sign in front, it's going to open uh, downward. So that's how you can graph uh, quadratic expressions using transformations. Now let's talk about how to solve quadratic equations by factoring. Let's begin with this quadratic expression. x squared minus 25 is equal to 0. How can we factor the expression and also solve for x? So there's something called the difference of perfect squares. x squared is a perfect square and 25 is a perfect square. 
to factor it, it's going to be a minus b times a plus b. The square root of x squared is x. The square root of 25 is 5. One is going to be positive, the other will be negative. And that's how you factor it. Now let's set each factor equal to 0. So let's set x plus 5 equal to 0 and x minus 5 equal to 0. So the first answer, x is equal to negative 5. And for the second answer, it's equal to positive 5. Now let's work on another example. x squared minus 36 is equal to 0. The square root of x squared is x. And what is the square root of 36? It turns out that 6 times 6 is 36, so that's the square root of 36. And one will be positive, the other will be negative. And then solve for x. So x is equal to negative 6 and positive 6. Try this one. So what is the square root of 4? The square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of x squared is x. So the square root of 4x squared is 2x. The square root of 49 is 7, and this is going to be plus and minus. Now let's set each factor equal to 0. So first, let's subtract both sides by 7. So we can see that 2x is equal to negative 7. And then let's divide by 2. So for the first one, x is equal to negative 7 over 2. Now here, let's add 7 to both sides. So 2x is equal to positive 7. And then let's divide by 2. So x is 7 over 2. So it's positive 7 over 2 and negative 7 over 2. What would you do if you see this expression? How can you factor it and solve for x? Now the square root of 3 is not a nice number. And the square root of 48 is not a perfect square. However, you could take out the GCF, the greatest common factor, which is 3. If we take out 3, 3x three squared divided by 3 is equal to x squared. Negative 48 divided by 3 is negative 16. So now we have two perfect squares. The square root of x squared is x. The square root of 16 is 4. One is positive, the other is negative. And based on the last examples, we could easily tell that x will equal negative 4 and positive 4. You simply have to reverse the two signs. Now, how can we factor a trinomial where the leading coefficient is 1? And let's solve for x at the same time. To factor an expression that looks like this, find two numbers that multiply to the constant term of 24 and then add to the middle coefficient of 10. So what are some numbers that multiply to 24? We have 1 and 24, 2 and 12, 3 and 8, and 4 and 6. However, only 4 plus 6 adds up to 10. So to factor it, it's simply going to be x plus 4 times x plus 6. And then to solve, the, um, to solve for x, simply change the sign. So x is going to be negative 4 and negative 6, and that's it. So let's work on a few more examples, since this type of problem is very common. Feel free to pause the video and find two numbers that multiply to negative 24, but add to positive 5. So we have 1 and negative 24, 2 and negative 12, 3 and negative 8. Notice that 3 plus negative 8 is negative 5. If we reverse it, negative 3 plus 8 is positive 5, but these two numbers still multiply to negative 24. So it's going to be x minus 3 times x plus 8, and therefore x is going to equal the reverse. That's positive 3 and negative 8. Here's another one. x squared minus 2x minus 35 is equal to 0. So what two numbers multiply to negative 35 and add to negative 2? 
7 times 5 is 35. So we can do it as negative 7 and 5, or 7 and negative 5. 7 plus negative 5 adds up to positive 2, but negative 7 plus 5 adds up to negative 2. So this is the one we want to use. So it's going to be x minus 7 times x plus 5. And so x will be equal to positive 7, and x will be equal to negative 5. Let's try one more example where we have a trinomial with a leading coefficient of 1. This time, we're not going to only factor it, but we're going to get the answer using the quadratic equation. So what two numbers multiply to 42, but add to negative 13? If we divide 42 by negative 1, we'll get negative 42. If we divide it by negative 2, we'll get negative 21. If we divide it by negative 3, we'll get negative 14. 4 doesn't go into 42. However, we can divide 42 by negative 6, and that will give us negative 7. A negative 6 plus negative 7 adds to negative 13. So we can factor it as x minus 6 times x minus 7. So x is equal to positive 6 and positive 7. So let's get these two answers using the quadratic equation. So this quadratic expression is in standard form. That is, it's ax squared plus bx plus c. So a is the number in front of x squared. So a is 1. b is negative 13. c is 42. To use the quadratic equation, you need to know the formula. It's negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Negative b is going to be negative times negative 13 plus or minus b squared. Negative 13 squared is 169. If you multiply negative 13 by negative 13, you will get positive 169. a is 1 and c is 42. So divided by 2a or 2 times 1, which is 2. So let's get rid of a few things. Negative times negative 13 is positive 13. And then it's plus or minus square root 169 and 4 multiplied by 42 is 168. And we have a 2 on the bottom. So 169 minus 168 is 1. And the square root of 1 is equal to 1. So we have 13 plus or minus 1 divided by 2. So at this point, we could set that expression equal to two separate expressions. So we could say it's 13 plus 1 divided by 2, or we could say it's 13 minus 1 divided by 2. So as you can see, we're going to get two answers. 13 plus 1 is 14, and 13 minus 1 is 12. 14 divided by 2 is uh, 7 and 12 divided by 2 is 6. So we get the same two answers that we had earlier. Now let's factor a trinomial where the leading coefficient is not 1. Let's try this one. 2x squared plus 5x minus 12 is equal to 0. We're going to factor it, solve for x, and then we're going to confirm our answer using the quadratic equation. So to factor an expression that looks like this, first multiply the leading coefficient by the constant term. 2 times negative 12 is negative 24. Then find two numbers that multiply to negative 24, but that add to the middle coefficient of 5. So we know 8 times 3 is 24, but one of these numbers has to be negative. Let's put the negative with the 3. 8 times negative 3 is negative 24, but 8 plus negative 3 is positive 5. Now what we're going to do in this example is that we're going to replace the 5x with 8x and negative 3x because 8x minus 3x adds up to 5x. And then we're going to use a technique called factoring by grouping. So let's get rid of this stuff. When you have four terms, you can factor by grouping if the first two terms has the same ratio as the last two terms. For instance, consider the 2 and the 8. 
8 divided by 2 is the same as negative 12 divided by negative 3. Both answers equal 4. Whenever you see that, you can factor by grouping. So in the first two terms, let's take out the GCF, the greatest common factor, which is 2x. 2x squared divided by 2x is x. 8x divided by 2x is 4. Now, in the last two terms, let's also take out the GCF, which is negative 3. Negative 3x divided by negative 3 is x. And negative 12 divided by negative 3 is positive 4. So if you see these two factors, if they're the same, that means you're on the right track. That particular factor, write it once. And then everything you see outside of that, 2x minus 3, that's going to go in the next parentheses. So that's how you can factor it. And you can FOIL these two binomials to check and make sure that you do indeed get this expression. Now let's set each factor equal to 0. So here, let's subtract both sides by 4. So we can see that x is negative 4. And then let's add 3 to both sides. So 2x is equal to 3, which means x is 3 over 2. So these are the two answers. Let's go ahead and try to get those two answers using the quadratic equation. So we can see a is equal to 2, b is equal to 5, and uh, c is equal to negative 12. So x is equal to negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. So b is 5, which means b squared or 5 times 5 is 25 minus 4 times a, which is 2, times c, which is negative 12, divided by 2a, or 2 times 2. So this is negative 5 plus or minus 25. Now 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 12 is 96. And because of the two negative signs, it's going to be positive 96. And on the bottom, 2 times 2 is 4. Now 25 plus 96 is 121. And the square root of 121 is 11. So we have negative 5 plus or minus 11 divided by 4. Now let's separate it into two expressions, negative 5 plus 11 over 4 and negative 5 minus 11 over 4. So negative 5 plus 11 is the same as 11 minus 5, which is positive 6. Negative 5 minus 11 is negative 16. Now 6 over 4, we can reduce it if we divide both numbers by 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3, 4 divided by 2 is 2. So the first answer is 3 over 2 which is an answer that we had before. Now, negative 16 divided by 4 is negative 4. And this is the other answer. So as you can see, we get the same answers using the quadratic equation or even by factoring the expression. Both methods work. Now, let's try a harder example. How can we factor this expression? 12x squared minus 83x plus 66. Now, using the same technique, we would have to multiply 12 by 66. 12 times 66 is a big number. It's 792. What two numbers multiply to 792 but add to negative 83? Now, this expression is factorable, by the way. So if you know an expression is factorable, but you just don't know how to factor it, what can you do? 
Is there a fallback method that you can apply? It turns out that there is, and that is the quadratic formula. You can use the quadratic formula to work backwards to factor the expression. So let's go ahead and do that in this particular example. So let's make a list of the values that we have. So A is 12, B is negative 83, and C is 66. So X will be equal to negative B, that's negative, negative 83, and then plus or minus square root B squared. So 83 times 83, or 83 squared, is 6,889, minus 4 times A, which is 12, times C, which is uh, 66, divided by 2A, or 2 times 12. So negative times negative 83 is positive 83. Four times 12 is 48, times 66, that's 3,168, and two times 12 is uh, 24. Now let's subtract 6,889 by 3,168. So that's 3,721. And the square root of 3,721 is 61. So we're going to have 83 plus or minus 61 over 24. So therefore, we have two values, 83 plus 61 over 24 and 83 minus 61 over 24. 83 plus 61 is 144. 83 minus 61 is 22. 144 divided by 24 is equal to a whole number, 6. And 22 over 24 is not a whole number, so we need to reduce the fraction. Let's divide it by 2. If we do that, 22 divided by 2 is 11, half of 24 is 12, so the other answer is 11 over 12. So using the solutions, we can now factor the expression. So here's what you need to do. Write two equations, x is equal to 6, and x is equal to 11 over 12. Now, what you want to do is you want to get 0 on one side of the equation. So here, let's subtract both sides by 6. And here, we're going to subtract both sides by 11 over 12. So let's get rid of this. So what we have is x minus 6 is equal to 0. These two cancel. And for this one, x minus 11 over 12 is equal to uh, 0. So we don't need to change this factor. However, we do need to get rid of the fraction. To do that, let's multiply both sides by 12. So x times 12 is 12x. 12 11 over 12 times 12, the 12s cancel, giving you 11. So this is going to be minus 11, and 0 times 12 is 0. So these are the two factors. So therefore, to factor the expression, it's going to be x minus 6 times 12x minus 11. And now let's make sure that this is indeed the right expression. So let's FOIL it. x times 12x is 12x squared. x times negative 11 is negative 11x. Negative 6 times 12x is negative 72x. And negative 6 times negative 11 is positive 66. Now the two numbers that multiply to the product of 12 times 66, which was uh, 12 times 66 was 792, 
Remember, we needed two numbers that multiplied to 792 but added to negative 83. It turns out that those two numbers are the two numbers in the middle. Negative 11 times negative 72 is positive 792, and they add to negative 83. So as you can see, this technique works. So if you can factor the expression, but if you don't know how to factor it, you can use the quadratic equation to get the solution, and from the solution you can write the factors. Consider these two equations, x squared is equal to 9 and x squared is equal to negative 9. Let's solve for x in both equations. To do that, we can take the square root of both sides. The square root of x squared is simply x. The square root of 9 is plus or minus 3. Now, on the left side, we're going to have plus or minus the square root of negative 9. What is the square root of negative 9? It's important to understand that the square root of negative 1 is equal to an imaginary number, in this case i. So negative 9 can be written as 9 times negative 1. The square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of negative 1 is i. So in this case, instead of getting plus or minus 3, the answer is plus or minus 3i. So it's positive 3i and negative 3i. i is always equal to the square root of negative 1. i squared is equal to negative 1. Now i to the third power, which is the same as i times i squared, that's equal to i, and i squared is negative 1. So i to the third power is simply equal to negative i. Now what about i to the fourth power? i to the fourth power is basically i squared times another i squared. And each i squared is negative 1. So negative 1 times uh, negative 1 is simply equal to 1. So make sure you know these four values. i is equal to the square root of negative 1. i squared is negative 1. i cubed is the same as negative i and i to the fourth is 1. Now let's talk about solving systems of equations. So let's say if we have two linear equations, 2x plus y is equal to 5, and 3x minus y is equal to 0. And we have two variables to solve for, x and y. In order to solve for two variables, you need two equations. If you have three variables, you need three equations to solve it. Whenever the x and y variables are aligned, neatly as the way you see them, it's best to use the elimination method. To do that, simply add the two equations. y and negative y will cancel. 2x plus 3x is 5. 5 plus 0 is 5. So to solve for x, uh, let's divide both sides by 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1, so x is 1. So now what we're going to do is uh, replace x with 1 in the first equation. So 2 times 1 plus y is equal to 5. 2 times 1 is 2. And now we need to subtract both sides by 2. So 5 minus 2 is equal to 3. So the solution is 1 comma 3. Let's try another example. 3x plus 4y is equal to 25. And uh, 5x minus 3y is equal to 3. So let's focus on canceling the y variables. Notice that if we add the two equations now, these two won't cancel. The least common multiple of 3 and 4 is 12. If you're not sure what the least common multiple is, you could just multiply 3 and 4, and that number will work. So let's get to 12. Let's multiply the 4y by 3, and the second equation by uh, 4. If we do that, 4y times 3 is 12y, negative 3y times 4 is negative 12y. So they're going to be the same, but they're going to have the opposite sign, so they will cancel. Now we got to multiply everything by 3 in the first equation. Whatever you do to the left side, you must also do to the right side. 
3x times 3 is 9x. 4x, I mean 4y times 3 is 12y. And 25 times 3 is 75. Now let's multiply the entire equation by 4. 5x times 4 is 20x. Negative 3y times 4 is negative 12y. 3 times 4 is 12. So if we add the two equations, we can see that the y variables will cancel. 9 plus 20 is 29. 75 plus 12 is 87. And if we divide 87 by 29, that's equal to 3. So x is 3. So now let's rewrite the first equation. 3x plus 4y is equal to 25. And let's replace x with 3, and let's solve for y. 3 times 3 is 9. 25 minus 9 is 16. 16 divided by 4 is 4. So y is equal to 4. So the answer is 3 comma 4. x comma y. Now what if you were to see two equations like this? In this case, it's best to use the substitution method. We can replace y with 2x plus 5, since they're equal to each other. And this will allow us to solve for x. So let's subtract both sides by 2x. 5x minus 2x is 3x. And now let's add 4 to both sides. 5 plus 4 is 9. The last thing we need to do here is divide by 3. 9 divided by 3 is 3, so x is 3. Now once you have the value of x, you can plug it into any one of these two equations. And you should get the same y value. So 2 times 3 is 6 plus 5, that's 11. And if we plug it into the other equation, 5 times 3 is 15, minus 4 is also 11. So the answer is 3 comma 11. Now what if the two equations are presented differently than the last example? Let's say if it looks something like this. Which method do you think we should use? In a situation like this, we should still use the substitution method. We can replace y with 7x minus 5, since they're equal to each other. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to have 2x plus 4. Instead of 4y, it's going to be 4 times 7x minus 5, which is equal to 10. And now we can solve for x. So let's distribute the 4. 4 times 7x is 28x, and 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. Now we can combine like terms. 2x and 28x is equal to 30x. And now let's add 20 to both sides. 10 plus 20 is 30. So 30x is equal to 30. And now we can divide both sides by 30. So we can clearly see that x is equal to 1. Now once you have this value, we can plug it into this equation to get y. So y is equal to 7 times 1 minus 5. 7 minus 5 is 2. So y is 2. So the solution is 1 comma 2. The other method that you can use is you can graph the two equations. When you graph them, the solution is the point of intersection. The point at which the two lines meet, that is the answer to the question. You just have to look up the x and y values and you could do it that way as well. Now let's say if we have the function f of x is equal to 5x plus 4. What is the value of f of 3? Now this problem is pretty straightforward. When x is 3, what is the value of the function? All you got to do is replace x with 3. So it's 5 times 3, which is 15, plus 4, that's 19. But now what if you were to see an expression like this? Let's say if f of x is equal to 39. What is the value of x? In order to find the value of x, 
you need to know what the 39 represents. The 39 is equal to the entire function. It basically represents the y value. y is equal to f of x. So x is the number on the inside, y is the number on the outside. So in this particular case, we need to replace f of x with 39 and solve for x. 39 minus 4 is 35. And 35 divided by 5 is 7. So x is 7, which means f of 7 is equal to 39. Now, what is the value of f of 5 in this problem? We're going to evaluate the function when x is equal to 5 two ways. Let's use it the standard way. Let's replace x with 5. Five to the third power, which is 5 times 5 times 5, that's 125. 5 squared is 25 times 4 is 100. 6 times 5 is 30. And 125 minus 100 is 25. 30 minus 14 is 16. 25 plus 16 is 41. So let's see if we can get this answer using another technique. This other technique is called synthetic division. So we know that f of 5 is 4. So we're going to put a 5 here. And we need to place the coefficients. 1, negative 4, 6, negative 14 in decreasing order. So let's bring down the 1. 5 times 1 is 5. And then add negative 4 plus 5 is 1. 5 times 1 is 5. 6 plus 5 is 11. 5 times 11 is 55. Negative 14 plus 55, or 55 minus 14, is 41. So the remainder is equal to the value of the function. So that's another way in which you can evaluate difficult functions. Now let's review composite functions. Let's say f of x is 3x plus 5, and g of x is equal to x squared minus 4. So based on this information, what is f of g of x? Notice that g is inside of f. This expression can be written as f of g. It can look like this, fog. These two mean the same thing. In order to find the value of f of g of x, the expression, we need to take g and insert it into f. Now f of x is 3 times x plus 5. But instead of writing the x, we're going to replace x with x squared minus 4. So instead of writing 3x plus 5, it's going to be 3 times x squared minus 4 plus 5. Now let's distribute the 3. So it's 3x squared, and 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. And then we can add negative 12 plus 5. So it's 3x squared minus 7. So f of g of x is equal to this expression. Now what about g of f of x, which can be written as g of f. So this time we need to take the function f and insert it into g. So g is x squared minus 4. Instead of writing x squared, we're going to write 3x plus 5 squared. So we need to FOIL uh, the two expressions. 3x plus 5 squared is 3x plus 5 times 3x plus 5. 3x times 3x is 9x squared. And 3x plus 5, or 3x times 5, is 15x. And 5 times 3x is also 15x. And 5 times 5 is 25. We can add like terms. So 15x plus 15x is 30x. 25 minus 4 is 21. So the composite function is equal to that.
Now, let's say if we wish to evaluate f of g of 2. What's the answer? First, we need to find g of 2. So let's replace x with 2 in this equation. So it's 2 squared minus 4. 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. So g of 2 is equal to 0. So we can replace g of 2 with 0. So now we're looking for f of 0, which is 3 times 0 plus 5, using this equation. And that's equal to 5. So f of g of 2 is 5. Let's try another example. What is g of f of 3? So first, let's evaluate f of 3. That's 3 times 3 plus 5. 3 times 3 is 9, plus 5 is 14. So f of 3 is 14. So now we got to find g of 14 which is 14 squared minus 4. Now, 14 times 14, or 14 squared, is 196 minus 4. That's equal to 192. So if you see a number inside, your final answer should equal a number. If you see an x variable, your final answer should be an expression in terms of x. So just keep that in mind. Now let's briefly review inverse functions. f of x is the original function, and f to the negative 1 of x represents the inverse function. So let's say that for the original function, we have the points 2, 3, 4, negative 6, and negative 5, 2. To find the points of an inverse function, you need to switch the x and y values. So it's going to be 3, 2, negative 6, 4, and 2, negative 5. Now let's talk about the graphical relationship of an inverse function. So let's say this function is f of x. The inverse function is going to look something like this. And that's going to be f negative 1 of x. Now, notice that these two functions are symmetrical about the line y equals x. That's a property of inverse functions. They will always be symmetrical about that line. Now, let's say that f of x is equal to 7x minus 5. How can we find the inverse function? In order to do that, replace f of x with y. And in your next step, switch x and y. And then solve for y. So we need to add 5 to both sides. Let's move the negative 5 from the right side to the left side. On the right side is negative. On the left side, it's going to be positive. So it's x plus 5 is equal to 7y. Next, let's divide both sides by 7. So the inverse function is uh, x plus 5 over 7. So at this point, just replace y with the inverse function. That's how you can find it. Now, in order to prove if two functions are inverses of each other, here's what you need to do. Let's call the inverse function g of x. The composite function between f and g of x should equal x, and also g of f of x should equal x as well. If both of these conditions are satisfied, then f and g are inverses of each other. So let's go ahead and prove it. So let's start with f of g of x. So let's take g and insert it into f. So instead of writing 7x minus 5, it's going to be 7 times x plus 5 over 7. So notice that the 7s cancel, leaving behind x plus 5 minus 5. And these cancel, giving us x. So the first expression is true. f of g of x is x. And so now let's check out g of f of x. 
So this time we're going to take f, insert it into g. So instead of writing x plus 5 divided by 7, it's going to be 7x minus 5, which was in place of x, and then plus 5 over 7. So negative 5 plus 5 is 0. 7x divided by 7 is x. So that's how you can prove if two functions are inverses of each other. So that is it for this video. If you like it, feel free to comment, subscribe, uh, share this video with your friends. Also, if you want to find more uh, algebra videos, feel free to uh, go to my channel and check out my playlist. I have a lot of other topics. I recognize that this video is only scratching the surface of all the algebra topics that you need to know. So if you check out my playlist, you can find other topics uh, throughout the uh, college algebra course that you might be taking. I also have some other videos on like physics, uh, general chemistry, pre-calculus, trig, calculus as well. So you might find those helpful um, if you check it out. So thanks for watching and uh, have a great day.